It's the next level. In the end, there was only one. A single black infinitude. Then the infinitude found release. And finally, the darkness broke. Filling it with life. With the multiverse. Every existence multiplied by possibility. spread out before space and time in infinite measure. Civilizations rose and fell, and rose again across reality's grasping expanse. Life, a precious gift, persevering in the face of every obstacle. Until, finally, the Age of Heroes was born. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. Welcome our guest, Ben. Hello! That's or whatever, exactly, that's or whatever you want to say. Or whatever I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and as always, I'm still Steve. So on this episode, we're going to discuss the CWDC Universe crossover show which is Crisis on Infinite Earths, Parts 4 and 5. This special episode will follow a slightly different format, but I have a little bit of knowledge about the DC Comics run of this story and the CW DC Universe shows. Steve only knows what he watched in this and these episodes, per se. And obviously, Ben, if you haven't listened to the DC Primetime Network show, oh my God, why haven't you? Uh, he's here, and he will give clarifications, because obviously, <laughs> my knowledge and my memory sucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least I can claim total ignorance. So. Well, I mean, and, and that's the thing, too. Like, going back and re-listening to parts, you know, when you guys recapped parts one through three and listening to it, Steve's got an excuse for being incorrect in a couple things. <laughs> Mark, not so much, but it's no. fine. <laughs> we have a bunch of first takes. What were your first takes, basically? basically for these uh, first two episodes of, uh, or the last two, I should so, say. So my impression of these final two was, I mean, let's be real. I was incredibly excited to see how this was going to wrap. And I was not disappointed slightly in the least. I've rewatched the I rewatched episodes one through parts one through three after they aired. Actually, I rewatched them a couple times uh, with no complaints. I've rewatched parts four and five once or twice again already, and I've even rewatched the entire crisis as a whole. And that's saying a lot considering they just aired the other day. Uh, I've already put my time in, and even in my rewatches, I have no complaints whatsoever. I was incredibly satisfied with how this wrapped up. And I'm looking forward to the shakeup this is going to make to the uh, the Arrowverse as a whole. Oh, definitely. It's amazing. So, Steve, what do you have? So, for me, these last two episodes were, like, the first three, I felt like I was able to follow them, even though I hadn't watched any of this stuff. But these these last two, there was a few things that really confused me. And I had to go to IMDb, and I had to go check a couple other sources just so I could understand kind of what was going on and who was who and who was doing what. And I'm still cloudy on quite a bit of it, actually. <laughs> was it more, was it more the final part that confused you? Cause part yes. three, I was going to say, cause yeah. part four, there's not a lot of difference. There's, there's no really additional characters yeah, that part were parts one through three. Yeah. The only thing that confused me was the cameo in part four. And once I figured out who that, what that cameo was, it made more sense, but no, part five was the big, just, I was just like, huh? Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Where, why? And, and we'll get, when we get down further down, yeah. you'll, 
you'll hear some of my questions about part five. So and and the cameo that nobody saw coming, which was so amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mark? Well, basically, the episode was really both episodes. Honestly, were interesting due to the history of the monitor, plus how Lex was instrumental and yet still devious, just like his counterpart in the comic. But it, it just basically gave us an insight of the Anti Monitor and where he came from, and that is what I really wanted to see because. Within the first three, we really didn't get any sort of history with what was going on with the Anti Monitor. We got a little bit. Um, a little we got bit. A, a little bit of a backstory and his explanation that his family was you know, was killed, and you know the Anti Monitor took them away from him as well. But yeah, you're right. We didn't get much of anything other than that. Yeah. So we'll continue on with thoughts on Part Four, Arrow Season Eight, Episode Eight. So, Ben, start us off. Hmm. So, where to begin? You know, it's, you know, from where we left off with everybody stranded at the vanishing point, I was really curious to how they were going to figure out a way around that. And I'm really glad that they went with the Speed Force being the one thing that they needed to get out of there. With some assistance from the Spectre, which... um Man, oh man, I'm so excited that they went that route with Oliver. Yeah, they changed it basically from the comic to the show, though. Well, but they kind of have to. Yeah, they do. Crisis is such a massive storyline. You know, we have characters that should be in crisis that aren't. Uh, You know, there are characters that were basically gone by the end of crisis that are still around because you couldn't kill them off in in this because you basically have to end shows by doing that uh so of course they had to make some adaptations but uh, you know compared to what they did with the comic and what they did with the television show i wasn't disappointed in the changes in the least i kind of feel like everything worked and you know in the sense of oliver becoming the specter and everything that happens by the end of part four uh you know this is the arrow episode so i thought it was kind of appropriate that they did it all in this episode and Oliver did make that final sacrifice. And in a way he became the new monitor. Oh yeah. You yeah, know, the, the monitor was the one that kind of, you know, cause the monitor, we, by the, everything that happens in this episode, they kind of rewrite the monitor story and that he's no longer the one that brings everybody together. And it's Oliver that creates the new multiverse, you know, in facing off against the anti monitor. And then we get that voiceover at the end of part five which is the the same voiceover that started the whole thing just with the with uh the monitor doing it. So in a sense, he became the new monitor by the end. Okay, that just broke my brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. Yeah. Exactly. How did that break your brain? Is that something you just it, didn't really think about? It didn't it well, it was it answers it helps me out with the with the ending the the way it ended with with uh, Spectre and Anti Monitor kind of fighting there, and and him being the one to kind of end it. Him being the one that kind of brought the heroes back together. You know, yeah. here he's the one who shows up in Part Four at the Vanishing Point. He's the one who who gets Barry the power so he can do his Speed Force thing. And I've got some questions about the Speed Force. The magic touch. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boop. I I put this in the note. Like as soon as I watched it, I actually paused. The first time I watched the the episode, I actually paused it and went to the notes and wrote this. I want someone to make a meme of of Spectre saying <laughs> just. <"Boop." laughs> well, but you know that brings up an interesting uh, an interesting question though too is like in that touch that the Spectre gave him because the Spectre in the comic books is an incredibly powerful being. I mean, oh yes, it, you know he is a character that is somebody who when you put somebody up against the anti-monitor the specter and they do battle in the comic books as well so that was rather appropriate that that was the way they did it and it it was just a twist of making oliver the new specter but it now brings up a question that i hope they really explore in the future of the flash in that by touching up by touching barry and opening up his abilities and you know his capability that wasn't undone by the end so i'm wondering if Barry is now faster than he ever was going into the future of the series. I think so. 
That's interesting. Yeah, to see if that if those abilities are still unlocked. What has he? How how did he use the Speed Force before? Barry is the Speed Force. If you're not familiar with the show, is the Speed Force is basically a. I don't want to call it a purgatory, but it kind of is in a way. And that purgatory kind of exists between worlds. It's how Oliver survived all of the worlds and the multiverse being destroyed. He was in purgatory. The speed force is kind of similar in the same aspect as that when Barry travels through time, the speed force is his conduit. Like it, okay. because, because the speed force exists infinitely. It exists in all of time and space. It's, it's how Barry was able to jump from worlds uh you know when we were first introduced to the multiverse in the arrowverse you know and you know in a correction that i needed to make from the first part the first time that we ever had barry and supergirl meet was by accident it was barry traveling the speed force and when he exited the speed force he ended up on kara's world and that was when they first met oh Um, so it's like it's like a test it's like the tesseract from other yeah in 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 a way you can any point in any time in any except not just not just place it's time also. it's time yes as well so that was how the speed force was able to that's that's how they were able to travel 10,000 years in the past was by using the speed force and right. the difficulty that they had which was kind of the basis for this episode when oliver approaches barry in the speed force and he tells them you need to find us before we are thrown from the speed force because these are beings barry is one with the speed force so he can travel the speed force without it's good to know you know he can travel the, the speed force without being thrown from it oliver sarah and the rest of the paragons are not meant to be in the speed force nope. they're they'll eventually be thrown from it which is why barry has to find them first and if they're thrown from the speed force before barry finds them they're thrown into nothing because right, into nothing the antimatter what exists yeah, now. because it yeah. does that and that's why he has to find them yeah. right okay yeah hopefully that kind of clarifies it a little bit I, I realize the explanation can be a little confusing no that actually clears it up quite a bit for me so good that that makes it makes sense now and and he doesn't have to just like this planet that he sent that he took supergirl lex and uh, uh ryan to he doesn't have to actually know where that place is he just has to think about it and there he is well, he kind of has to know in a sense, but it, yeah, I mean that's that's the easiest way. That's kind of that's kind of one of those MacGuffins in TV shows is like he doesn't have to. There's not really exits in the Speed Force. He just kind of has to, you know. It's not like oh, I missed my exit. It, it's you know, <laughs> he just kind of has to go, and that's what it is. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, but I mean, in in that's sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, um, go ahead. But you know, it by them going back to Maltus, uh, you know, to confront the Monitor 10,000 years ago, or Marnovu at that point, he wasn't the Monitor yet, um, you know, to undo everything, he's, ba- Barry is basically, and Mark, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say this, Barry is basically, the Paragons are creating another Flashpoint. Yes. You know, in, in and that's this. why we get what we get in episode, what, nine? Yeah. 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 I love there, – there was some really – and I didn't put this in the notes. There was some really cool Easter egg moments that I thought was interesting. And I think – what did he say Time Lords or Time Masters? I think he said Time Masters when Osric Chow is doing his – which I absolutely love that, that beginning where he's writing the letter to his wife. And he's like, well, you're dead, but I'm still going to write this letter. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and he just explains like where each of the Paragons are at. He's like the Paragon of Courage is just working herself to death because she's just – for a fight that's never going to come. The Paragon of Hope has lost her hope. The Paragon of Truth is a jerk and a douchebag. A douchebag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're trying to repair these Time Master technology. And he he goes through each and every one of them. So he, he gives us this whole, without having to do an actual recap or not have to tell us three months later, you know, he's got this full beard. And we can see that they've been in the vanishing point for a while trying to figure out what do we do and that was the perfect place because that was the only place they could go where the anti-monitor couldn't find them well because if if you haven't been watching um legends of tomorrow you know this goes back to the first season of legends of 
of tomorrow where because they were brought together as Mark had you know discussed with you when, when you guys recapped parts one through three Rip Hunter was the one that brought them together Rip Hunter Rip Hunter was a time master from the future and okay. the time masters existed at the vanishing point by the end of season one I, I think it's season one it's, it might be even season two of Legends of Tomorrow the end of the, season two okay the vanishing point is destroyed Okay. Um, and that's where they are, because even though the vanishing point is destroyed, it still exists out time, outside of time. Gotcha. So that's gotcha. why they're safe from everything that the Anti Monitor does. Okay, makes sense. And I, I loved when they when they got to that planet and Osri and Lex takes off, and Osric Ch- Ryan says, "I love Osric Chow. He's I love him for Supernatural. I said that yeah. in the last." The, the last episode we did, but uh, I love when he says Lex Luthor dice or Lex pulled a Luther on us. Yeah. I, thought that was, I thought that was great, but yeah, that answers, that answers some more of those, those questions that I had. Good. All right. Well, we have thoughts on part four of our season eight, episode eight. And these are basically comic callbacks and similarities, but things change within this universe, as we all know. So, my thought was the, the planet of Maltus that the Monitor was from is a version of Krona in the original Crisis comics and the, in the comic book itself. He only sees the beginning of his universe beginning, not all multiverses in the original comic. So, but is this the dawning of the multiverse when, we, when he actually does do that which creates the multiverse within the comic due to his work as a scientist and creating the anti-monitor so from what we see is that when he goes back in time he actually sees his own universe being recreated but an alternate timeline so ben correct me (laughs) (laughs) um okay so in in the television series, what is happening is, and I believe it's been a long time since I've read the comics, since I've read the comic series, and I really should go back and reread it. He is, he, yes, he is in his own universe, which is, it's never really clarified which universe he's in. Exactly. Um, but he, he is not aware of the multiverse. But at this point in time, the multiverse does exist. It is established a little bit later in part five that at that point in time, the multiverse does exist because there's a moment in part five where, you know, the anti monitor comes back and they're like, well, what, why is this happening? We stopped the monitor from going back. And the anti monitor says, you stopped that monitor from coming to visit me. There are multiple other earths or multiple other universes in which that monitor comes to see me. You can't stop them all. Uh, So at the point of his, when we see him 10,000 years in the past on Maltus, the multiverse does in fact exist. Marnovu is just not aware of it. And then he goes back to the beginning of time, which is what we see. And that's when worlds collide and the anti-monitor is technically created because there's no separation of of matter and antimatter at that point that's exactly. when it in that's in essence when it happens so the anti-monitor is created in his likeness and it doesn't matter again which version of marno vu it was they stopped one they're not going to stop them all yeah that was something that i put in my part five notes was that jumped out at me a realization is that there is no anti-multiverse anti-multiverse there's there's only one antimatter universe. There's there's the universe which includes all of the multiverse, and then there's the mul- the antiverse, right? Which is what he was trying to create, right? And that's and that's why there's only one of him, but it, it, but there's multiples of the other guy, and there was no way they were ever going to be able to stop all of them. Yes, they would have had to go to every single multiverse version and. Ryan would have got tired of making his speech. <laughs> <laughs> he would have died before he was able yeah. because there's an infinite number of Earths. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, he it, it would have it would have been impossible. You know, which is why, like, I had somebody ask. I had saw I had seen somebody post online that they thought part they thought part five was kind of useless, and I'm like, no, it really wasn't because you had to. You, you kind of had to fix that whole point that there really was more than one Marnovu. This was going to happen. This 
this was something that was inevitable. And not only did you, have, did you need part five to set that up and establish that, you needed to establish Earth Prime. You know? yeah. So part five was needed. It wasn't a useless, it was not a useless part no, of Crisis. No, setting. part five, part five sets up all your, whatever TV series shows are going to be left. Yeah, After it sets up done. it sets up the change that's going to happen to every one of these shows. And it gives them the opportunity if they with some of the shows that they referenced in the in that little montage oh, you know, there at the very end, it. it gives them the chance to get those back bring those back, maybe. Well, because oh, okay. you there are and we'll get to this when we talk to part when we talk yeah. part five, but there are two moments in that whole montage at the end that um are series that are happening. Okay. Cool. Oh yeah. Every one of those moments that we got is or is going to be a series. Very cool. That's why they're all in there. It's basically expanding on the universe that they already have. And that would be the DC app that we have with uh Teen Titans. Oh, it's just Titans. I needed to correct you on that last week too. Oh, it's just Titans. It's all just right. Titans. They're not Teen-, <laughs> Teen Titans is animated. DC Universe's show is just Titans. I always forget about that. That's yep. that's the whole thing. And on top of that, because I don't subscribe to the DC app, unfortunately. So what? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't either. It's okay. Yeah, but also on top of that, we got Doom Patrol. Yes. As well. So that that expands upon that as well, from what you were saying. Well, Doom Patrol, Swamp Thing. Um, oh, yeah. there, there is a moment in there where we see the cast of Stargirl assembled, yep. yes. uh, and Green Lantern, which is a, which is a new series coming. Oh, it's, no, going, they, it's a they go. Had a, they oh. had a commercial, they had a commercial for Stargirl that aired here after the, or in between the last act break. Yeah. Cause Stargirl is actually going to air on both CW and DC universe. Oh, okay. Um, ah, okay. It's 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 going to air on CW, and then it is available for streaming on DC Universe after it airs. There, but there's a bunch of hints. Green Lantern is in fact greenlit. It's going to be an HBO Max series created by Greg Berlanti, which is amazing. So it is in fact going to be part of this this. Well, I mean, this Crisis on Infinite Earths basically establishes that everything we've ever seen DC is part of this universe. Uh, and they finalized that with the Ezra Miller cameo, no, uh, which we was, haven't even got. We haven't even gotten to yet. We're, 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 we can, I know. We finished talking about part four here. Uh, uh, I did want to. I did want to bring up something real quick, just from from my point of view of not knowing the the shows and not having watched the shows. Those those memory moments that we had, the way they played them were perfect. That I didn't need any setup for what was going on. I didn't need to know what the particular episodes or what crossover episodes those flashback memories came from. There was just enough in there to get, that. That was one moment that didn't, none of those confused me at all. I understood exactly what was, well, not exactly what was happening or where, but I knew that it was just flash going into their memories, using the speed force to go into their memories, to find them so we could get them back. Yeah, to real, to, to real time. So I thought that was really well well done the way they wrote it and the way he kept repeating, "You're not really here," because it wasn't their memory. So yeah, uh, I just I really I really wanted to, to get that out before we got too far past part four. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I, I I tend to, and Steve, you know this from listening to the Lost podcast. <laughs> I I tend to skip around a lot. Oh no, it's fine. We do the same thing. So it's good. Okay. Um, yeah. The only, the only other thing I wanted to make mention of too is, you know, at that and, and you know what, forget it. I'll save it for when we get to part five. I'm well, jumping around too much. Talk again, talk a little bit about that, that cameo, because like I said, that was one point that it, it did confuse me when I saw it. I had to, I had to go into IMDB and figure out who this other flash was. And once I saw who the other flash was, I realized how monumentous, that moment is because it does open up the tv shows it's something that marvel didn't do with the netflix shows but they have now opened up their tv show universe with their movie universe well the marvel the netflix shows have acknowledged though the the movie universe Mm -hmm. um you know um 
Daredevil acknowledged the events that happened with the Avengers in New York City. So, I mean, it's been established that they are all, in fact, in the same universe. And, yes. um, you know, um, Sarah from uh, Thor appeared in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, I mean, well, okay. I mean, again, that's not a, that's not a, a Netflix series because right, right. Coulson was in fact from both um right. but no the netflix shows have established that they're in the, in the same universe by mentioning events that happen right but in- but the the marvel cinematic universe has not acknowledged the netflix shows i guess is what i was what i was meaning so none of those except for agents of shield which isn't a netflix show but yeah um, but they at least established that you know even if it was just in the tv series they did establish that they were in the same universe yeah. the 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 dc television and dc eu have never at any point established that either of the other existed until this moment. Yeah, and that's why it was so huge. Yes. Yeah. And the background of this cameo happening is just such an amazing story that I if Mark, if you don't know it, I will tell it. Yo, tell it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm taking over your podcast. No, please. Do that's it, why we it, brought you it. here. We need so, a, we need an expert. <laughs> so Mark Guggenheim, who is the um obviously the the head honcho of the shows at um at CW and Warner Brothers, uh, you know, he's basically in charge of the television elements. You know, they basically, they just greenlit the Flash standalone movie that's going to be happening. And the head honcho over at Warner Brothers called Mark Guggenheim and said, hey, any chance you can get Ezra in the crossover? And, you know, Guggenheim got excited. He's like, "Uh, yeah, let's do this. And the guy at Warner Brothers was like, well, how do you want to do it? Because I know you're already wrapped on filming. He's like, you tell us, you can give us Ezra, we'll make it happen. So their next step was to call Grant because they were not going to do it without permission from Grant because this is Grant's baby. This is like, he's the guy that's playing Barry Allen right now. Yeah. So if Grant wasn't behind it, they were not going to do it. So they call Grant. Again, they're already wrapped at this yeah. point. You know, they're, they're already wrapped crisis. So it was going to be asking a lot to, for Grant to come back and do this. And they called Grant and Grant was extremely excited. He's like, yes, let's do this. Like, let's make this happen. So they called Ezra. They let Ezra know that they had permission to use him. Does he want to do it? And Ezra was very excited as well. So these two got together. They brought back an entire crew from Flash back up to Toronto to film just this short scene between the two of them. And it got ended, it got edited in, in post-production. And, you know, so this is a scene that was actually filmed after crisis was already over after they were done filming everything. That's pretty uh, cool. And it changes the landscape of the DC properties because now not only did we see this cameo of Ezra Miller as the flash in this universe. And again, this is the magnificence of the speed force. Like this is how these two, these two guys were able to exist in the same spot was because of the speed force. They're okay. both, they yeah. both exist in the speed force. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, it does. You know, and so now not only was this, a, did it give us this great moment in the television series, but now with the flash movie coming, this gives us an opportunity to possibly give Grant Gruston a cameo in the flash film. Right. Oh, Which that's cool. Amazing. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, the only other thing I had from part four is that for me, anyway, the ending was a little bit as, as powerful as it was with Oliver sacrificing himself in order for the universes to come back in order for, in order for earth prime to be created. It was a little anticlimactic for me that as he's fighting, it's just the Paragon's doing their Care Bear stare. Yeah. Yeah. Thing, <laughs> you know, uh, to how do we help him? Just focus, just <laughs> focus and look. And I was just like, seriously, really? Yeah, <laughs> Is that, I know. Like, but it, it, it was it just me, or was it a little easy? And I mean, it was through all five parts, really. A little easy to defeat. I mean, I know there was a lot of them, but like to defeat the shadow creatures, all you gotta do is basically punch them or kick them, and they just dissipate. Well, I mean, they are basically just fog. I mean, okay, you know, they're shadows. That's you know, so you you break a shadow and it breaks apart. It's makes sense. You know, real quick, uh, just going back to the Ezra Miller cameo for a second. Yeah. Uh, sure. This did make a big revelation that I don't know if anybody else picked up on it or not. When Bar- when Grant Gustin's Barry Allen introduces himself to the Flash, there's a moment where Grant where where Ezra Miller says, "The Flash." The Flash. Yep. And it makes you realize <laughs> in the two movies that he's been in, in his cameo in uh, Batman v Superman, 
Yep. And um, in he Justice was never League, clarified as he was, the Flash. He was never named. That's oh, right. Oh, now that made that that can that did. It, I didn't put it in the notes, but I remember I noticed it the second time I watched the episode that I was like, "Why is he confused about the name?" You know, that makes sense that they never that in those movies they never actually named the character. Nope, they never named him the Flash. He was never given the name the Flash. That's it took cool. the Flash to give him the name the Flash. That's yep. cool. So if if so, that might be one of those. Yeah, that would be an interesting cameo for Grant Gustin. Too. I think it would be very clever if they actually use that scene that they filmed in the yes. movie. In the movie, yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be cool. That would be that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. In the and we get the other itself. we we're getting the other side of it, right? Yeah, and then he starts calling himself the Flash after that moment. Yeah, exactly. Huh. There's another setup of something very interesting of uh, the end of part four going into part five, and that's Luther. Uh, <laughs> it's setting up something very interesting because there's a particular moment at the end of part four where he says, oh, this is what it feels like to be a superhero. Yeah. And it sets up something going into part five where see, where you see him accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. If you're not familiar with the comic books, especially post-crisis, there is a storyline where Lex Luthor does indeed become a member of the Justice League. Yes, he does. He is a good guy. And I'm wondering if that's where they're going to go with his character now in the future of Supergirl. Yeah. Well, that, John Cryer will be a, a regular character if that's the case, and that would be amazing. And it would be great to see him wearing the Luthor armor again, actually fighting alongside Supergirl. Yeah, well, it, it, it would that be eliminate dynamic. his powers, though. That's the whole thing. Would, well, that's it, we don't know. We don't know if he still has his powers or not because he doesn't well, that's, display them in part. Well, that's why I say it'd be cool to w- see him wearing the Luther suit because mm-hmm. the, with the with the the Luther armor, he can fly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it would be better because he even says in his speech, "I don't have any superpowers." Yeah, but he's, but, he's very well aware of who Kara is, and when he gives her that wink, he knows. Every, he remember well. He was a paragon, so right. he, yeah. he, well, he became a paragon, so he remembers everything that happened too. He just rewrote his own future with still keeping that page. He rewrote his own future to make himself a hero rather than the villain. Yeah. Well, yeah. now I know why Michael Rosenbaum didn't really want to be in part of this. <laughs> well, I don't think they. Well, at the point that Rosenbaum, when they approached Rosenbaum, the script wasn't written yet. That was one of the reasons why Rosenbaum turned it down. Like he, they, when they approached him, he's like, well, what is it paying? They're like, well, we don't exactly know yet. Well, what's the script? Well, the script hasn't been written yet. Oh, okay. Well, I don't want to do it. Cause yeah. Rosenbaum has been very open about it. Um, after turning it down and saying they didn't have, they didn't know what he was getting paid and they didn't have a script. Uh, so that whole element might not have been, you know, goals to him. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's that too brings up that that interesting point that he didn't want to commit to a project that he didn't have any information on yeah which makes sense for an actor i mean some of them now some of them may have just jumped at it as soon as somebody said hey you want to play you know superman again sure or you want to play whatever i mean erica durant it was probably it was probably easy for her because she was already in the she's already been in supergirl yeah yeah so uh and i mentioned that in the last episode that it would have been an interesting dynamic for if supergirl had gone to that small if, bill. If Lois had met Alora. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be <laughs> that, interesting. That would be interesting. Sort of like when Ray met Clark. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Ray, you got buff. Uh that's <laughs> no. not Ray. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> kind of your cousin. Okay. <laughs> and can I just say this is going back to parts one through three, but man, oh man, did I geek out so hard the moment he showed up on screen as Clark Kent. Oh because yeah. There was that, you get that classic John Williams music in the background. And then fast forward a couple minutes later when he runs off and back on screen and shows up in that Kingdom Come outfit, man. I geeked out so hard. Oh, it it, it was amazing. It was really cool. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take a breath and let you guys talk. It is your podcast. So that brings us to to part five. So, Mark, why don't you start us out with the comic callbacks for part five? That would be the anti-monitor during the battle. That was done within the comic, but when his physical being was destroyed by Supergirl and was brought by himself through Cosmic, he became bigger. And, uh, you know, pretty much as a being. And 
the, the show showed him being just larger. Whereas when in the actual comic book, he became very mutant looking, very distorted and very disturbing, disturbing looking and very huge. He it's called became, a budget. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and, and, and then when the Adam reduced him, but that was not the case within, you know, the comic. Yeah, you know, he, he did a huge and large, like, Galactus in the comic, but also more distorted. We we don't get that in this. But it made perfect for what it needed for within the show itself. They just made him far larger and just you know, everybody having to attack him as such, which to me was, you know, it, it worked for me. I, I actually enjoyed it. So is that how they defeated him in the comic with the bomb that reduced him, that made him just keep getting smaller and smaller for etern- all eternity? Or was there no. a different way they defeat? Okay. No, it was a different, completely different outcome from my understanding from what I reread. <laughs> okay. You are correct. I don't remember exactly what it is, but I, I know it, that's not how they defeated him in the uh, in the comic book. Yeah, Jerry Ordway, actually, who is one of the artists, actually stated it. He goes, that was not how we drew it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when I spoke to him at the comic shop recently, he was like, yeah, I enjoyed it for what it was for the actual show, but that's not how we drew it, and that's not what Marv Wolfman or uh, Wolf did the actual writing for, so they they did what they needed to do for within the show itself. So it was the ends to justify the means for what they needed to for the show. And honestly, for those that are listening, read the comic and then just watch the show. You know, the, they're two different entities. You know, honestly, yeah. in, in my opinion. You know, they're two different things, and you have to watch and read. So if you have never read Crisis on Infinite Earths, go out there and buy it. There is a trade paperback out there, so go out there and get it. If not, just live with what we have with (laughs) the CW because, honestly, we all loved watching these things that are from panels to pixels. (laughs) <laughs> but everything is interpreted. I see what in you did there. <laughs> so yeah, was there I, anything? Was there anything else that was that, that was a callback to the comic book? Well, other than the guy that wrote it? Well, that, <laughs> I didn't know about that until I saw Mark uh, mention that. Uh, uh, yeah. So the guy that this is the 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 man that comes up asking for the autograph there yeah. from Flash and Supergirl. He's the guy who actually wrote the the comic. Uh, it, it makes you wonder if they did they contact Jerry to try to get the illustrator in there also. I don't know. I I have <laughs> not asked Jerry since because he's just been watching and I you know we we pass each other by at the comic shop. That's about it. <laughs> but uh, he he said he's been enjoying the show as it is. Good. So you know it, it coming from an artist that actually drew on the comic book and him saying he is actually enjoying the actual show that makes sense. Very cool. So, so we've already discussed most of the, the questions and, and comments I had uh, regarding this episode, but I do have one big question that towards the end of the second watch that I really wanted somebody, somebody needs to explain to me. What is the difference between White Canary and Black Canary besides – I understand they're two different people with two different white, outfits, but um White Canary is basically a trained assassin. Uh, Black Canary is a metahuman with the ability of like a siren, a, a siren scream. Okay, so which one was Arrow and which one was Legends of Tomorrow? They actually both started on Arrow. White Canary came after Black Canary, but White Canary was then moved to Legends at a certain point. And she's um, the one that they kept calling Captain. Yes, because okay. she is the ca- she is the captain of the Wave Rider. She is the new leader of the Legends of Tomorrow. Okay, cool, cool. That makes sense. Um, that was that was the that was where I was getting confused. I was just like, I, I do what. <laughs> and and Mark, to go back to your last episode, um, not so much a correction, but more of a little bit of an explanation. Uh, sure. And this is kind of addressed more at Steve as well, too, because uh, Steve was asking about this. The Legends of Tomorrow, when that show was created, was these weren't like a bunch of like loser characters. The Basically, the premise behind Legends of Tomorrow was they took these characters from these shows that were actually fan favorite characters. Um, you know, you had Heat Wave and uh, 
Captain Cold from The Flash. You had yep. Sarah from Arrow. Uh, you had Ray Palmer from Arrow and The Flash because he kind of crossed over to both. You had all these characters that were actually fan favorites with the fans, but they really didn't have a place to put them on the show anymore. Yeah. So that was where they created Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, that and makes sense then. They kind well, of brought them all together. Yeah, they, they brought them all together because apparently they thought of them as people that didn't go anywhere. And they, they, were, they were outcasts. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. they weren't anywhere in history in their minds, quote unquote. And they were, they were expendable characters. Exactly. As as Rip Hunter, who initially brought them all together, told them, when it comes to this, when it comes to the history of Earth, where when it comes to the history of the the Age of Heroes, you are all expendable. Right. Yeah. None of them. None of them were gonna were gonna headline their own show. Yes. Exactly. So they put them all. That makes sense. I like it. Yep. Yep. I'm gonna check it out. It's it's on my list. Let me tell you, let, I I'm a huge fan of the Flash. Like I love the Flash and and everything. Yep. Legends has been phenomenal. It's, For, it's, it's every season humorous and fun. <laughs> yes. It and it's the closest thing out of all of these shows to a live action comic book. Like yeah. it's it's there is an underlying continuous story throughout everything, but for the most part, it's one off stories every week. It's like you just cool. finished one issue, you can jump right into the next. Cool. And yeah. they expand upon that between every other show that's on the CW too. That, that's yeah, my feeling. Yeah. Well, the legends have played a part in all of them. Oh yeah, definitely. And the exactly. legends, and this kind of dives into part five as well. And this was something they kind of did on all, on all five parts, but it happened the most in part five. And it's, <laughs> typ- it, it's typical legends territory of break of pseudo breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> and that, you know, when Ray Palmer says, wait, did we miss another crossover? I love those moments. I love yes, all those that. moments. And, and when they, when they, legends, when they were like, did you get kidnapped? <laughs> we, we set one out and they, they commit a felony. You yeah. know? I and I can good. tell you. Honestly, talk about the crossover and it's the whole thing. It's like, all right. My, but I will tell you Deadpool? though, <laughs> my favorite moment of all of the pseudo fourth wall breaks didn't come from Ray. It didn't come from Sarah. It came from Diggle. And it was when Diggle was set, when they're doing this whole explanation of the crossovers, and John Diggle's like, I'm never letting my kids watch his show again. <laughs> I, was, I, I that. lost <laughs> it. I was like, oh, my God, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely <laughs> was. We'll continue on, and we'll actually talk about uh, great show moments. You actually took a bunch of mine. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, Sorry. Uh, uh, come on, bringing back a Bebo? That was a callback to a Legends of Tomorrow episode. Come on. That, that, that was oh, amazing. multiple that was Legends of Tomorrow episodes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, oh, my God. And the beauty of it is, too, like a little bit of a side story. I actually moderated a panel this past summer with a couple members of the Legends of Tomorrow and a couple cast members of the Legends of Tomorrow. And they mentioned it in this crossover in part five about how, you know, all the, they had all these totems come together to create a big Bebo that they use to defeat the big bad of the season. Um, this was not this past season. It was the season before that. And I remember Nick Zano, who plays Steel, who actually is in the crossover. He's one of the people on the ship that they kind of go back to. He's the one that mentions they kidnap and, and create right, a felony. Right, okay. Um, he actually, they, they shared a story about when they first read the script about transforming into Bebo. They were like, um, yeah, we're going to lose the audience on this. <laughs> this. This is not going to work. This, like, we are totally jumping the shark on this. And, like, I, we're going to do it because it's written, but I'm guaranteeing we're going to lose the audience. And he says, and then, the, and then the finale aired, and the fans effing loved it. <laughs> Very cool. He's like, and then you fast forward to this next season, this last season finale. He's like, where the show ends with me on a guitar singing a, a um, singing a song with the guy that played Biff, and there's a Minotaur there and a bunch of other people. He's like, if we didn't jump the shark last season, we're jumping the shark this season. <laughs> and the fans effing loved it. He's like, so now I don't question a damn thing the writers put in there because the fans are going to love it. So Bebo has been 
and Sarah kind of even mentions it. White Canary even mentions it. Like Bebo, like you could do this, you could do this, but Bebo is sacred territory. Yeah. And <laughs> that's another techno pseudo fourth wall break because that's the truth when it comes to that show. The fans effing love Bebo. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next part I would have would be Gleek. We Gleek. got Gleek yeah. at the end of the episode with the Super Friends theme. And the Hall of Justice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the empty chair for Oliver Queen or Elijah, yes. whichever one comes back first. Yeah. Which, who? <laughs> it's a Jewish thing. They, oh. They Passover, they, they always leave an empty chair for Elijah. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, I got religious on you for a second. No, it's, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> But yeah, I just thought that, that was one of those moments where I, I was like, why do they have a chair? I like, like, I understand we're honoring Oliver, but why do they have a chair for him? So. Well, <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's an honor. It's, you know, it's yeah. basically an honor of Oliver. It's, there's a chair for Oliver because he was part of that team. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, seeing the table of the, of the Justice League, seeing, uh, the, seeing the empty cage of Gleek, which, God, they better bring him in at some point. If they could do Grodd, they could do Gleek. <laughs> Uh, exactly that's what i brought up at, at certain points in my notes is yeah. the fact that, that they had grod and what was it star city and what is the name of flesh's compound i always forget <laughs> oh uh star labs star labs yeah yeah so the, if they had a, a cage for grod then they had a cage for gleek yes and he was something else that they experimented on so come on so uh, apparently that must have been something that was in there. And to get that, the music at the end, mm -hmm. filled every kid that was born in the 70s or even <laughs> not, late 60s. Not even. I was born in 79, so I was born towards the end, but I watched the Super Friends. I, I mean, I, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, so hearing that music with Gleek, uh, yeah. you know, and then seeing the Hall of Justice, like, yes, this is. Yeah, we, we all knew what it was and we all knew what, you know what? You know. Like, oh, as soon as I heard, as soon as I heard the monkey sounds, I was just like, <laughs> I can't remember his name. I was like, I don't remember the name, but there was a monkey that was involved with the whole. And then they showed the the cage. I was like, oh yeah. Uh, I did have one question that maybe you guys can can help me out with. It is wh why does Martian John Jones all of a sudden have the ability to like find the people who don't remember and just touch them on their forehead and boop them again and give them memories. One of John's, Mar he's used this before. Um, okay. John, okay. John's, one of John's Martian abilities is he does have the ability to unlock certain areas of the brain. Okay. Um, um, so he was the only one out of everybody who would have been able to restore people's original memories. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John is the Martian Manhunter. So yes, and, and it's and it's not even that he restored their memories. He basically gave them visions of a past life because they wouldn't be original memories because those characters never existed before. It, right. They got erased. You know, right. these are different it, versions. It, of characters. Yeah, it's almost him showing them the memory, other people's memories. Yes, is yeah. what he's doing. Because yeah. like like uh, uh, like Ray said, I was jacked. I was I was a Superman. You know, and well, you weren't a Superman, a version of that looked like you was a super, you know, so yeah. It's, okay. not, it's not so much him giving them memories. It's basically him just, it's him giving him, it giving the characters the cliff notes of everything he remembered. He's right. basically sharing his memories with them. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. And that would make sense why, why Pariah, why, why he gave Nash got so, you know, apologetic all of a sudden because john was so mad and all of his memories would have been totally negative and so if he pushed those into into him that's all he would have got was the negative of what he did yes okay yeah yeah so it's not so much like making them remember he's basically sharing his memories and experiences with them right. in like in an instant okay exactly okay so with the end we have a few other earths now we have an earth prime so Geek have, out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now we have all these other things in the CW, and they can interact without bridging with a crossover event. Basically, Brandon Routh's Superman also 
Christopher Reeves, which he basically represents as well. Oh, it's confirmed. That's who he is. Yeah, exactly. He's that particular Superman, and we all know that. And that's how I feel, too, because, you know, Superman Returns, that's who Brandon Routh is, is that particular Superman. And then, but we also get Doomsday Squad on their planet basically incorporates everybody within, you know, that particular universe. Doomsday Squad? You mean the Doom Patrol? uh, Doom Patrol. Yeah, Yeah. there you go. (laughs) Doomsday Squad is something completely different. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What's the Doom Patrol? Yeah, yeah yes. and, and that's – so, So, because I – like, let's talk about that montage because you said you know – I don't know all those different shows. I mean, I, I recognize Swamp Thing as, as soon as I saw him, and that's a separate Earth. But doesn't this really show that we're just going to have the same problem? I mean, that the comic books ran into and that the show is going to run into is that you're going to have these multiple – you're still going to have multi, – the multiverse is still out there apparently. But it's, why? why did our – these certain characters get merged together? This was basically a way for them to, because, you know, when you have parts one through three and you get that montage in the beginning of part one where you see, you know, Earth, um, Earth 89 with Batman's world and, Mm -hmm. you know, you get Smallville's world and you get Earth 666 with Lucifer, which, my God, that was amazing. Um, (laughs) uh, Because I wasn't, I was hopeful, but I wasn't expecting. So it was a surprise when I got it. You know, and then you get Earth-9, which is where the Titans are from. And, you know, all these Earths were erased from existence. And if you don't correct that by the end of this, you leave open the question, well, okay, if all we're seeing is Earth-Prime, does that mean the Titans are now part of that Earth? Does that mean that all these other ones are part of that Earth? But all of these other shows exist. So... You, this was basically just a way for the producers to kind of course correct and say, okay, these shows are back. These shows are going to continue. They're not going to cross over with this universe anymore because they never really did to begin with. These are the characters that are going to interact with each other. All of these other ones are just going to be off on their own. Okay, cool. And, and yeah. So it's a story device just so that we don't, we no longer have to worry about the multiverse. We yes, don't have to worry exactly. about them. We, so, because the, basically every of the DC, well, of Flash, Batwoman, Legends of Tomorrow, Supergirl, the Arrowverse, as is the as Arrowverse, it is. as it's yes. called, yeah. That Arrowverse is now. They are all now on one world. They are all still, now part of Earth Prime. Yes. Right, and there's still other multiverses out there, and we're going to get shows from those from those things, but they won't cross over. They won't cross over anymore. So okay. there there will still continue to be crossovers amongst the Arrowverse, but they won't deal with the multiverse anymore. There's no more jump. There's no more jumping Earths or anything like that anymore. Which is actually going to bring up a very interesting thing when it comes to Flash, because one person who was not in Part Five was Cisco, aka Vibe, who was given mm-hmm. back his abilities. So the next time we see Cisco, he might not be Vibe again. Interesting. Yeah. Well, considering what we saw, what was it a season ago or two seasons ago when Flash? He met Cisco later on in the future where he didn't have his powers. Well, Cisco gave up his abilities in the Flash. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Because he, he wanted to be normal. Um, but yes, there were there were crossovers where he's met other versions of Cisco himself. who didn't have abilities. But he's met other versions of himself that did. Yes. Um, who were actually evil. Yes, exactly. So now these these with this multiverse all being a part of Earth Prime, it's now a good possibility that those versions of himself never existed oh, because wow. it kind of merged all these versions together. Right. You know, so it's it's going to be very interesting to see what they do with Cisco's character on the Flash now because as the ability of a vibe is he's able to jump from point to point, but he was also able to jump from Earth to Earth with that ability. You can still keep him as vibe and give him the point to point abilities, but there's really no point now keeping him from world to world. Right. Exactly. Because he doesn't have to do that anymore. Right. And and it'll be interesting. It's intriguing with these shows going forward. What are we going to see? Like when Batwoman goes back to Gotham, I'm assuming that she's going to go back to oh yeah Gotham she, City. She's going back to Gotham. She's now going to have to interact with people who have different memories. Or well, they're they're all going to have to. Do they're that. all going to yeah. They're all going to be interacting with people that have to, just like just like Supergirl ran into with me. Was it Nia? Is that her name? Nia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, she's, she's the only Lex she knows is the good guy Lex. 
And, and it, it's going to be very interesting because it, it's going to be an interesting dynamic because who were they going to clue into what the actual, to what they remember and mm-hmm. what they not? Because yeah. obviously they let Ray in on it. They let Caitlin in on it. You know, Mick was let in on it and, and all of them about what was, what had actually happened. But you're right. Like now does John give Nia the, the vision so that she remembers everything? Does Alex... His, uh, you know, uh, Kara's sister know the the truth about what happened. Well, um, and like the Tyler, the Tyler Hawkland Superman, they gave him the memories. So when Lois said two kids, two, you know, <laughs> yeah, your boys, and he's like, boys, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, your two sons. And so there's a whole new set of yeah. memories he's gonna have to find out about. Well, it's well. In- and Diggle has uh, uh, Sarah back. Yeah, Sarah back as well as his son. And what happened to Oliver Queen's daughter? So the next episode of Arrow, there are two episodes of Arrow left. Uh The next episode of Arrow, which is the one that's going to be airing this week, is actually a backdoor pilot to the Arrow spinoff, which is Green Arrow and the Canaries, which is actually takes place in the future and is surrounded. It's about Mia, his daughter becoming the new Green Arrow, and uh, Laurel is there in the future, Dinah is there in the future, I think Renee is there in the future. Oh, okay. It's the future versions of themselves, but now the dynamic of that show is going to change from what we've already seen in Arrow in Flash Forwards, because now Connor is no longer there, Connor is Sarah again, and I don't think the son that we saw with Diggle was Connor, I think that was John Jr., Yes. Which is Diggle's adopted son, not his actual son. His actual son got turned back to Sarah, which is what she originally started as. And then Flashpoint happened, which changed Sarah to Connor, or or JJ, rather. Or maybe I'm confused. I don't know. Maybe Connor (laughs) is the adopted son. I have no idea. Connor is the adopted son. Sorry. Connor is the adopted son. So... It's going to be interesting now because Connor is one of the main characters of the Flash Forwards and Arrow, and now he's gone thanks to Crisis. Yeah. So he may not be in the in the spinoff now. He might not be a character. Or, well, I don't it, know. It does make me a little bit interested in checking out these shows again. Maybe trying to tackle Arrow. Definitely Legends Tomorrow is, is going on my list. Batwoman is now going to go on my list. I'm going to have to figure out a way to watch that. And possibly- I have ways, my friend. Possibly Supergirl. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't. Super. I, I will tell you this. As somebody who's watched these shows from the beginning and, mm-hmm. and podcasts about these shows every week, season one of Supergirl is is okay. Uh, yeah. It struggled a little bit because it wasn't directly connected to the Arrowverse yet. And it was a, C- a CBS show. Okay. Uh, CBS gave the rights back over to CW and then Supergirl in season two moved over to CW. Oh, um, okay. And then it became... In essentially a part of the Arrowverse oh, yeah. um, when they did the first crossover with Barry and Kara that I had mentioned earlier where Barry gets there by mistake. And then it gets better. There's, there's moments it struggles a little bit, but it's been a, it's been a strong show since the beginning okay. um, or since season two. Legends gets better and better every season. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, Flash, Legends is definitely there. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Flash, it's a strong show has its moments of weakness from time to time. Sure. Um, but for the most part, I have been very pleased with it. Arrow is a different story. Um, <laughs> Arrow season one is fantastic. Yes. Arrow season two is even better. Arrow season three is on par with season two. Season four, crapola. Uh. <laughs> um, season five, are we allowed to curse? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> season five, fucking phenomenal okay (laughs) um season five is holy shit phenomenal like it is my favorite season of that show season six (laughs) dumpster fire (laughs) has one of the worst episodes of any arrowverse show i've ever seen so much so that when rob and i talked about it on dc primetime it became one of our highest rated episodes because everybody wanted to hear us dump on that episode yeah. Anybody listening who's curious, that was episode, oh, I don't remember which one it was, but the title of the episode is called Collision Course. And it was basically Arrow versus version, Arrow's version of Civil Marvel Civil War, and it sucked. Season seven, struggled again. Season eight, this final season, this shortened season, has been fantastic. Well, they're trying to make up for what they lost out in season And it's a, it's a greatest hit season. Yes, exactly. So, and Batwoman is still on season one. It's it's been it's been fairly strong. It's fairly strong, and 
honestly, you know, everybody calls her the Mary Sue, but honestly, I love the idea of Batwoman, and I can't promote it anymore. Can I just say one of my favorite moments of the end of part five sure. um, was when they're doing the whole immemorial to Oliver was the scene with Alex, Kara, and mm-hmm. Batwoman all together. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a hint that those two are going to have an awesome friendship. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, well, and just, I had it in my notes, just the way Supergirl reacts when she first sees sees Batwoman show up and she just geeks out like, oh, look who it is. It's, it's, it was almost like it took me out of it for a minute the first time I watched it because she gets so excited about the fact that Batwoman is is there. Well, be- and it's, it's great because their first interaction in last year's crossover was the first time they ever met. Yeah. And, you know, they meet each other a couple times and then by the end of the episode, you know, Supergirl, they're standing there as Supergirl and Batwoman and Supergirl calls her Kate and she's like, X-ray vision, remember? Yeah. And then, and then they, they yeah. progress in the conversation and she's like, all right, Alex. Yeah. And she's like, remember, I'm a detective. Like, it's this fantastic moment where, like, they, there's this whole mutual respect between the two of them that they've totally figured out who each other are, but there's that respect between the two of them. So, yeah, well, yeah, and even we saw that in, in part uh, whatever part it was, part two or part three, when with the when book, she, yeah, with with the book and with the kryptonite, when she shows Kara that she has the kryptonite, and Kara says, "We'll keep it in case you ever have to use." it. Oh yeah, Kara, not Alex. I don't know uh, why I said Alex. Yeah, so that's so. There's definitely something there, and I, I think it's I think it's really cool. I, I I just it's it's exciting to to see it. Yeah, well, yeah. it's it's basically that whole Batman Superman vibe that we get from these shows. Because we don't have a true Batman. We have Tyler as being Superman, but there's no Supreme Superman at this point. You know. Eh, yeah, there is. Yeah, uh, that we, would be Brandon. We, we, <laughs> that's that's <laughs> what I was opinion. hinting at. Can I tell you, like, I, I'm so glad that they still gave us that. That they, I loved it. That they said, yeah. okay, here's Earth-96. Here's Clark again. Here's Brandon Routh Superman back to being himself. Yeah. Yes. You know, he's got the yellow back in the in the shield in the emblem and he does that whole little wince at the at the screen as yeah. he's flying through space. I'm like, "Yes, thank you for restoring that." That was my childhood right there. That brought me back to saying, "Okay, yeah, Brandon Routh is pretty much the envision of what Christopher Reeves Superman was." And I'm glad they brought that back. But right now, what we have within the shows is is that we have Supergirl, Kara, and then we have Kate as Batwoman, and they're basically the Batman and Supergirl for this show to do what they need to do within that means. Yes. yes. So I, I just, to me, that was like heart wrenching. I'm like, oh great, this is what made me love this. I'm like, we got that camaraderie even though it's a little bit you know if you look at the comics <laughs> both batman and superman were both friends but they were both a little bit distant at certain points um <laughs> it, it's so funny my mind just went on a little train ride um as you were talking about that when you said like their relationship is a little bit different and it it only it almost made me say martha <laughs> um, <laughs> um but a little side note. I was going to say, Martha. Um, <laughs> but there's a little side note. There's a funny moment in Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Yes. With that. <laughs> when, ben, when Ben hints at like his mother's name, they share their mother's name or nice. something like that. I'm like, yeah, that was a nice little thing. But yeah, I, almost, I was almost like, you mean Martha? And um, for those of you fans out there that are listening, please go watch Jay and Silent Bob reboot. <laughs> Yeah, we all have. I can I can talk about that. Like, just like my quick review of that movie was, it's great. It's it's typical Kevin Smith, but there are oh, definitely yeah. moments of that movie that feel a little forced. To oh, me. definitely, it was fan serviced at, at certain points. And I actually tweeted Kevin out that saying, but honestly, I could see where he was coming from. Oh and yeah, I still loved it. I still enjoyed I it. I still loved it, and I, I I love it as it is. But you know, whenever for... you talk about fan service, I t- I just I just echo what the guys on House Podcast could say. I don't mind being serviced. I'm very <laughs> happy with being serviced, as me. I have no problem with fan service. But it, it, it's fun, you know. I actually kind of referenced it to Kevin Smith on his Twitter, saying, "Hey, 
I, I kind of see some similarity to your Jay and Silent Bob reboot to comic book the movie that Mark Hamill did. But, oh, wait, you eliminated Mark Hamill from your movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of setup by the end. And, it, you know, going back to the whole Superman Lois moment when, you know, she says your sons. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because that was actually already hinted at yeah. in that – you know, in, in part one of Crisis, you know, he says he always envisioned them having two kids, yeah. um, you know, two sons. Uh, so that's kind of what he ends up with at the end. And also the Superman, the Superman and Lois television series just got greenlit and sent yep. the series. Oh, wow. Um, and the casting for that called for casting for two young boys. Um, so they, that was the direction they were going to be, because I was talking to people about it, like, well, two boys, like he only has one kid. Like, what are they going to do? Maybe one of them's going to be um, like Batman's kid, um, uh, Wayne's kid. Um, no, because he does have a son. Um, yeah, in, yeah. In, but, uh, in but, now we, but now we know we have that set up. So that's, yes. that's, that's good to know. So I was going to ask that question. If, if this uh, Superman and Lois, if they are just, are they regular cast members or are they just kind of like recurring characters on Supergirl? No, Superman actually hasn't been, Superman and Lois were actually off Supergirl for about an entire season. They were brought back for last year's crossover and then okay. we haven't seen them again since last year's crossover. Okay, so they're just, they were just kind of recurring characters then. Yes, yeah. they're, they're secondary guest star characters. Okay. But they but made now, mainstream. But yes. now they're going to get their own show, so cool. Yeah. And I, I love Tyler's version of Superman. I think it's a oh, fantastic yeah, version of Superman. So I'm excited for this. It's a little this, small, uh, but I'm okay with it. Well, they even <laughs> joke about that too. He's a little bit shorter than, you know, small well, <laughs> well, I was going to say, when, when Lois, when Liz Tulak's version of Lois sees Tom Welling's version of, of, uh, of Superman, and she's like, well. He's right, off the, he's right off the paper towel box. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, which, can I tell you, that was another fantastic moment that I loved from oh, part same two. Here. I love oh. it. I, I couldn't get enough of that scene. I wish, I, I, I mean, as much as I was, I was very fulfilled with what, with what they had, it would have been cool to see him come back as well. Oh, I I knew but, I knew that he was never going to suit up. Okay. No, no, no. But I like, mean, like it would have been cool if in that montage they, you know, showed a quick clip of that Earth and showed me. Oh, that he was restored. Yeah, yeah. That maybe showed him and Lois on the on the couch watching TV with the two little girls running around or something. You know, just just a quick montage to show us that they got restored. As yeah, well. that would. Yeah, you're right. That would have been nice. I don't think it was necess- I don't think it was necessary though, because again, he didn't have abilities anymore. And they were really just showing other heroes that existed again. Yeah, no, and I'm completely happy with what we with what we got from it. So. Yeah, same here. I, I loved what we got from him. It was amazing. I, I the fact that we got somebody from Smallville. Come on. I don't know the fact that it was Tom Welling. Like it's that was such a great move for him to come back and yeah. do that. And what they did with him, you know, was basically their way of saying like, okay, fans, we're bringing him back, but don't expect us to ever bring him back again because yeah. they're we're we're going to give you a reason that we won't have to. Yeah. It's oh, good. Wasn't I'm he okay in Lucifer too? <laughs> he wasn't Lucifer. That was when I interviewed him. That was when yeah, we had him. We had him on our hundredth episode of DC Primetime, and I got him on the podcast to talk about. It was it was so funny because when I reached out to his rep, and they were like, "Well, Tom doesn't really want to talk about Smallville, but you know, obviously, since you're a DC show, you know, he'll talk about it for a couple minutes. He really wants to promote, you know, his his role in Lucifer." And I'm like, "Yeah." I'm fine with that. Like, I want to talk to him about his role in Lucifer. And then when I finally got him on, I was like, can we talk about Smallville for a minute? He's like, we can talk about Smallville as much as you want. And I'm like, what? Like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, your rep's a freaking liar, man. Because he, he, he enjoyed talking about Smallville. Yeah. You know, I think but he, he's come to that point in his life where – he accepted it and he enjoys it and he enjoys the actual celebrity from it. And because now he started doing cons now too. Oh yeah. Um, and him you know, and he does him a lot now. Him and Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what they're doing. And it was so funny. Cause when I had him on, I asked him, I'm like, okay, I've got you here. Let's just set the record straight. The rumor out there is there was a no flights, no tights thing that you set from, from episode one that you were never going to fly. You were never going to wear the suit. Is that true? He's like, that is absolutely true. Wow. Like I said from the beginning that this was about Clark's development and it was about Clark 
not Superman. He's like, so that was the agreement from the very beginning that I was never going to suit up as Superman and I was never going to fly. He's like, and if it was going to happen, it was going to be in the series finale. And that's exactly how it happened. Yep. Yeah. So, so when they announced he was coming back for crisis and like the internet went freaking wild, man. They're like, oh, we're going to finally get to see him as Superman. I'm like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. I knew that it was going to happen, yeah. but you know, honestly, I enjoyed what I got and exactly. I love Tom Welling for doing that. And it showed a lot. And yeah. you know, I, I would, you know, I would love to see Rosie on your show though. On the- I'm I'm trying, man. We're celebrating our 200th this week. Actually, we have yet wow. to record it. Congratulations! Uh, it's also our final episode. Yes, you guys are time. saying that that you're, uh, you're done, huh? We're recording the 200th, which is parts four and five of Crisis, and then we've got one more episode, which is our epilogue. And we are going to have some special guests on our epilogue. Some of them have been recorded already. Others, we're still trying to work out scheduling to get them in. So it might be like a week or two out before our epilogue airs. Um, because we want to get these in, but actually, what's today at the time we're recording this? It's Thursday, correct? Yes, correct. Um, the two days ago, we had our buddy John Wesley Ship come back onto the podcast and join us for one final time. And he has always been an amazing guest for us. It was our, his third time joining us. He's always willing to come on and. We got to talk about crisis, and I just realized I'm totally self promoting myself instead of talking about crisis on Infinite Earths. This is your podcast. This is your podcast, not mine. Let's get back to crisis. Yeah, but this is the network. Come on, man. (laughs) Uh, we we love it, and I can't wait to hear what you guys uh, what you guys said about these two episodes. And I'm I I want to say we I know we said at the beginning, and we're we're getting towards winding down here. But I I do want to thank you very much for coming on our podcast, Ben. Yeah, of course, I love talking, and that's the thing. Like we're not doing DC Prime Time anymore, but anytime you guys like you guys are basically going to be taking the torch of the DC stuff. Oh. Um, that's a you heavy, know that's a heavy load, man. Well, you don't have to do it every. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. You don't have to do it weekly like we. Do. Like when you're covering the crossovers and stuff like that, we're yeah. not recording anymore about DC, but we're still going to be watching. Yeah. So right. I will happily still come back on. It'll actually give me the chance to geek out because I won't have my platform anymore to do it. We're Rob and I are still going to keep podcasting. Uh, it's just the 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 DC chapter has is coming to an end. Um, but you will always have a seat here, and you will always be welcomed. You know that. Don't say that, because I'll just say, see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we're even sure what we're doing next week yet. So. Uh, but no, man, like any time I get the chance to come on, you know I, I always Absolutely. appreciate it. I love, as if, as, if, as if it hasn't been revealed yet in my previous guests on your podcast and this one, I like to, uh, I like to do this thing called talk. I do it a lot. You guys have all met me in person. I tend to do it in person as well, uh, which is why podcasting has always been a great platform for me because it gives me the chance to talk, which I like to do. So, you know, yeah, I will always welcome an opportunity to guests, not just on this podcast, but any podcast I get a chance. Well, Mark, your final thoughts on Crisis on Infinite Earths. Well, my final thoughts on Crisis on Infinite Earths for this lovely little miniseries crossover, I, I really enjoyed the show. They had to do a lot with what they had within their own universe because of basically licensing and what characters they had. But I think they made it work very well, and I loved it. A lot better than Smallville's Justice League, but <laughs> we got hey, man. it years ago. Smallville's Justice League still gave us Dr. Fate and Hawkman, so I'm okay with it. Yeah, that is true, and we lost that on Hawkman and Hawkgirl. Uh, We never got Diggle as uh, the Green Lantern that you and I spoke about on a side note. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I, you know what? I'm not disappointed with that. I, I, I'm okay with it. Rob was dead set that it was going to happen. And I'm like, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen on crisis. And when it doesn't happen on crisis, it's not going to happen at all. It's not going to happen. But honestly, we didn't get it, but honestly, I'm happy with what we got at the end. And the little kid in me is so happy and glee the fact that we got actually a justice league at the end. You yeah. know, uh, they actually had all the chairs. They had this abandoned warehouse where they pay tribute to Ollie and they had a round table. And obviously we got the little leak <laughs> thing at the end. Wait, Gleek was in this? <laughs> <laughs> well, not really, but in a sense, they segued to it and gave us the little 
music and I was, you know, the little kid in me was like so happy. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. I would never have dreamed that this would have happened at all. You know, to me, I, I'm just happy. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, the, the show ended at a very well and very rounded way. So now we have more to look forward to with Batwoman. We have, I don't know if it's the last season of The Flash. Or... No, they've all been renewed for new seasons. I was going to say, even Legends has got another season yeah. coming. Everything, I think, I think I, Arrow's the only one that's ending. Rumors of cancellations of any of these shows are only speculation. They're far from true. Every show, with the exception of Arrow, got a renewal for next season. I just hope we see the, the continuing actors that are in those shows. That's the whole thing. I don't want to see Brandon Routh leave. I don't want to see... Brandon him. Routh is leaving. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, you don't want to see Brandon Routh leave. He's leaving. <laughs> I know he. I know he's leaving, but I don't want to see him leave. <laughs> I don't either. I think he's a fantastic addition to that show. Yeah, but uh, the, the thing is, is that we're getting more, and that's the whole yeah. point. And the fact that we're getting a Superman show now... We're losing Arrow, but we're getting Superman and Lois, and we're getting Green Arrow and the Canaries. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited. Uh, yeah, I'm exactly. I'm actually kind of excited to to, to check that out because it's going to be. In the, I like stuff that's set in the future, and it's going to be interesting to see. So I may that may be one for us to to look at in the coming weeks and months. So yeah, we'll look into it more, and uh, we'll continue on with that. Uh, yeah, depending on when it premieres and what we do, maybe we'll do a, a three episode recap. Who knows? But we should move on to movie shows and what's going on in comic news. So with that, Ben, I know you saw this, the new Black Widow trailer hit. And, you know, we got more David Harbour. What do you think? That's all I need. <laughs> David Harbour is is all I need. I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. I am I love the Marvel films. But after Spider-Man Far From Home and even during Spider-Man Far From Home, I, like Endgame, don't get me wrong, was phenomenal. Like, I absolutely yeah. loved every second of it. I cried. I cheered. I still get chills at the Avengers Assemble scene. Oh, yeah. You know, but man, by the end of that movie, I was, I was Marvel exhausted. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's been 10 years. And yeah. like, even the only reason why I was still excited for Spider-Man Far From Home was because Kevin Feige had thought out said, this is the end of phase three. Like, this is the end of the Infinity Saga. It's not Endgame. It's Far From Home. Right. Um, this is the epilogue to, to the Infinity Saga. Exactly. Black Widow, I'm excited. But man, like, the Marvel fatigue has set in and... While I'm excited, it's Marvel now to me isn't one of those I need to see it opening day movies anymore. I'm not as excited for Black Widow as I have been for other movies in the past. And I feel like it's because with the death of Black Widow in Endgame, spoilers, I feel like this movie's kind of coming a little too late. I thought so too. And <laughs> the, it, it should have came years before between Civil War and Infinity War. Yeah, you know, I feel like this was something they were alluding to. It's been rumored for a while they were giving Black Widow a movie, and I kind of feel like finally greenlighting it after after Endgame. It's it's. I feel like it was. It's too late. It's past its time. Um, Unless they were able to get her back from the dead, I don't know. They're, well, they're, it's a prequel. Yeah, so I know, but I'm saying, but like, if they're able to manipulate something in the future in another film to make it some sort of multiverse where they could bring back Black Widow. Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring up multiverse in Marvel because there is <laughs> another movie that had a trailer, and I'm, I'll save it for when you bring it up. Um, okay. But I have an interesting theory about this movie uh, so, when you bring it up. It's in I'm, your notes. So I'm not exhausted with the Marvel movies simply because I don't throw stones on thousands, hundreds of miles. Well, the like, thing is, I haven't seen all of them. Well, so for me, I'm excited. I don't want to be on this podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, but, you know, now with Disney Plus, I can go back and watch them all. Or eventually I'll be able to watch all of them. Most um, of them. If, if they're not on Disney Plus, they're still on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I'll, I'll get them. But I, so I'm, I'm still kind of excited for Black Widow. I, I want to see it. I don't know if I'll see it opening weekend or not. But, you know, it's, I, I like David Harbour. I like ScarJo. 
you know, so. Well, it, it's, it's interesting too, because this is the first ever, this is the movie, Black Widow will be the movie that proves that the Stranger Things universe actually exists in the Marvel universe. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> because by the end of the last season of Stranger Things, uh, we think that Hopper's dead, but he's not. He actually got sucked into the underground uh, or the upside down. The Russians found him, brainwashed him, and he became this guy in Black Widow for a short period of time. Could be. I'm, I'm not putting it past him. And then by the end of Black Widow, um, we're going to see the gang from Stranger Things come in and uh, <laughs> discover him and bring his memory back. Did I put that meme in a, a group chat that we actually all talk about? Yeah, with? I think I saw that meme somewhere. Okay. Wait a minute. Is this a real thing? Did somebody else actually come up with this? Yes, I put oh, a meme I... in the, the Zed Heads chat. Where yeah, we they... actually, I put the meme in there saying, oh, we know now where Harper is. Where, and it where was, Hopper went to. Where Hopper went, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, I just thought of that before. I didn't see that meme. So <laughs> nice. that's, it, that's funny that there's actually a meme out there for it. I did that like a couple of months ago about like when the first Black Widow <laughs> trailer <Yeah>. hit. <laughs> but I do. I mean, I, I want to see it more for David Harbour than I do ScarJo. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I David Harbor plays basically. If you think about it, he's playing the the Captain America in Russia. But yeah, that's exactly who that character is. <laughs> yeah, he's basically he's basically Captain Russia. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Comrade Russia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, you know, basically, go out there, everybody, listeners, go see that movie because I I anticipate it. I I love the idea. Even if it is a uh, kind of going back in time, but uh, well, rumor has it RDJ is in it too. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He makes an appearance. Huh. Yep, yeah. The next bit of news would be the Morbius trailer. That's pretty much mm -hmm. out, and it, it teases a lot. What are our thoughts in this? Because well, help, help me. I have a lot. <laughs> Explain to me. Oh, I, me too. I've <laughs> seen. I've seen this. I've seen the name. I, I've seen it on comic books. What is Morbius? Morbius basically is like a, a vampire? living vampire. Yeah. Basically, he was a doctor that was trying to cure his blood illness, and within that, he becomes a living vampire. This is kind of like the dark Marvel at that point. You have Morbius, the living vampire. You have Werewolf by Night, which was found in with J. Jonah Jameson's son through being an astronaut and you know, becoming a, a werewolf. Act, act you had the Night Stalkers. Uh, the Night um, Stalkers, yeah. The Night Stalkers who incorporated Ghost Rider and Blade, uh, Johnny Blaze, and a couple other characters. Exactly. Uh, and I think at certain points in their storyline, I think they even hunted Morbius. Yes, they did. Oh, at cool. certain points, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, that, that vampire establishes. Hunters. Okay. Yeah. So basically, there, there's like a whole dark universe within Marvel itself that includes Man-Thing, too. And on top of that, you know, we we got this this movie coming out. So, but apparently, within the trailer, we get like you see his beginnings, but towards the end of the trailer, we see him in a prison jumpsuit, which is orange. But as he's passing, he does see a Spider-Man poster saying "murderer" on it, and that's from actually a uh, a video game from last oh. year's Spider-Man. No, it's not. It's not? No. This is what I was talking about in my theory of this of this movie. Go ahead. Um, by the end of this movie, when you see him in that jump seat, there are two things in this trailer that make me believe they are setting up a Spider-Man multiverse. Because by the end of this trailer, there are hints to two separate Spider-Man universes within this trailer. The first is that poster. That is not a video game Spider-Man. So that is Toby Maguire. That's the Toby Maguire Spider-Man, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. So oh. we're gonna get Toby Maguire again. <laughs> well, but here's the thing: by the end of that trailer, we also see Michael Keaton's character of the Vulture, who was from yes. the Tom Holland Spider-Man multivert universe. Yep. Which makes me think they may be actually introducing the multi the Spider-Verse in this movie. Hmm. That would be amazing. Because it's been rumored, you know, with the whole Jake Gyllenhaal as Mysterio in Far From Home, mm -hmm. you know, talking about the multiverse, basically lying about it. This could be a possibility that they are actually, they are actually introducing the Spider-Verse into this movie. 
Hmm. Well, they've been okay. talking about this since the actual Spider Verse came out and the CGI animated forum. Mm -hmm. So if they do this, that would be amazing. I would love the idea. I do have other thoughts on this movie, though. Venom. How do I put uh, this? Yeah. How do I, know, I put I this? I know. I know. I had hopes for Venom, but it. Uh, it was entertaining. Yes. Was it what I wanted? No. I don't even think it was entertaining. I thought I was it was entertaining. Ba there was some bad CGI towards the end, definitely. But, <laughs> Bad's know, putting I, it lightly. Yeah, I, I. But the thing is, is that they had a good try. Now they are go for the new Venom movie. Now, if we get Venom with Carnage, and we do get a Spider-Man in there, that would be amazing. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons why they might be setting up the Spider-Verse in this movie is so that they can introduce a Spider-Man. I mean, that was one of my biggest issues with Venom was that how do you create Venom without Spider-Man? Yeah. Because yeah. Spider-Man yeah. created Venom. I mean, right. you know, they're yeah. connected. Secret Wars uh, issue eight, which yeah, where we saw the black suit Spider-Man. Yeah. And uh, we never got that Secret Wars episode or movie or whatnot. So we we never saw that takeover of Peter Parker only within the Tobey Maguire universe itself, but not within the Secret Wars. Which which this says a lot um, that I actually liked Topher Grace's version of Venom better than Tom Holland's. <laughs> wow, that's, 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 that's a lot. lot. Yeah, I would rather watch Spider-Man 3 again than watch Venom. <laughs> wow. That's not a lie. I did not like Venom, not one bit. I'm hard. I, well, I didn't like Venom. I didn't like the movie Venom. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's my big concern with, with Morbius. I want to see it because I know the character Morbius. Yeah. Here, here's where the issues lie. If there's not, if Spider-Man is not in this movie, if it's not revealed that he is not in this movie, Spider-Man was not in Venom. But Venom is a well-known character in comic book lore. Even if you don't read comic books, you know who Venom is. Mm -hmm. Morbius is not that kind of character. Only people who are avid – like, Steve, you proved it by asking who Morbius was. Yeah, like I said, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it on a comic rack, but I've never yeah. actually read any of their – Morbius is not a character that is well, as well-known as Venom. It's yeah. not a name that will sell a movie on its own. Just I think like Blade. I yeah. Well, yeah. Blade wasn't a well-known character. True. And he did very well in the late nineties. Now, if you use this movie to bring in a cameo of Spider-Man to establish that Morbius and Venom are in the same universe, and there is a Spider-Man that's in this universe, that's great. I would like it even better if they introduce the new Blade yes. in Morbius, because we know Blade has been cast. So if they use Morbius as a launching point for Blade, I'll be very excited. My my fear my fear for Morbius though is that Morbius is not a name that will sell a movie like Venom. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think Morbius and there are people out there who who can who either love or hate Jared Leto. Oh, um, I know a bunch of people who hate Jared Leto. I I I like him as an actor, Same but here. man he turned me off as Joker. Mm. Oh yeah, definitely. Totally and, turned me off as Joker. And they should have changed Harley Quinn. No, they or... shouldn't have. What? No, I think Harley. I think I think um, Margot Robbie's version of Harley is perfect. I think she's great. Yes, but they got they should have gotten rid of the tattoos and all that stuff. Similar that was assimilating to what nah, was I, Jared she... Leto's Joker. But no, but that's that was more accurate to the to the Earth-52 version of Harley than yeah, it, it Jared was, Leto's yeah. version was. I agree. Jared yeah. Leto's version was more like, he, it was more like Top Guard. Yeah, like, th that was... Hip-hop Joker. Yeah, that's... Like, yeah, <laughs> he was Joker the rapper. Like, that's that was not Joker. Harley was more accurate. Joker was just a disgrace. But you're right. Like, that's turned a lot of people off Jared Leto. So, you know, in casting Jared Leto, I think it, of knowing the character Morbius, I think it's great casting. Yeah. But if you're not a fan of Jared Leto and you don't know the character Morbius, you're not going to see this movie. Right. And I, I don't see Morbius as great as I think it looks. I don't see it being as successful as Venom. That's just my take. Uh, I, yeah, well, I, I think that's probably going to be the downfall, if anything, is that everybody's going to compare it to the Venom movie. And the one thing that I got from people that don't like the idea of Venom, the actual Venom movie, was the ending. 
everybody wanted to see Carnage. And oh, they wanted to see Cassius Clay become Carnage. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and it was wasn't the whole it, thing. Yeah, so it wasn't going to happen. And I think that will probably happen in some way or respect in the next Venom movie. Hopefully, they'll put in Tom Holland. Oh well, it's 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 going to happen in the next movie because they've already they've already announced that um, Woody Harrelson is playing Carnage in the next Venom movie. Ah, oh, okay. It's but it's going to be interesting. How do you set that up? Because I mean, Carnage was basically somebody who was created from both Spider Man and Venom. You already gave us garbage venom by creating him without Spider Man. Um, so now, how are you going to do Carnage? How are you going to get Carnage out of that without including Spider Man as well? I think they have to bring in a version of Spider Man. I think they have to. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, that was my take on Morbius. <laughs> a little bit more news. Basically, uh, Disney Plus was basically canceling Hawkeye. I did not hear this. I, I yeah, heard I about know. this. Hmm. Uh, apparently, it's all rumor. As yeah. far as from what I know, but basically, you know, Disney Plus was considering canceling Hawkeye. I was really interested in it, but I'm not a huge Hawkeye fan, but I'm curious about this. Apparently, Jared, uh, no, Jared Leto, jeez. We're talking about Jared Leto. God, I would never watch Hawkeye. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Renner? Jeremy Renner. Apparently, he made uh, accusations back in October, and I guess this got on Disney's radar based upon his wife and him wanting to kill her and himself based upon their divorce. And this was the reason why they wanted to end the show because they didn't want to have bad press. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I tried looking further into it, but I couldn't find much. I didn't hear anything about that with, with Jeremy Renner. I haven't heard any issues with like the wife and divorce and all that i mean that's not to say it's not true i just haven't heard any of it yeah i don't know i mean i it wasn't even scheduled for like until 2021 or something like that wasn't it i mean it wasn't even scheduled for this year so yeah they I, next year they, yeah definitely it was for next year but yeah. apparently I mean, it sounds like we don't. There's not much information out there. There's not really much information about it. But the one thing, I, it's like, like one day my phone blew up with all information about Jeremy Renner and Hawkeye because I have everything about Marvel, and it's like, oh, he said this back in October. Oh, Hawkeye is being canceled. What's going on? Did you so, get this? Did you get this from WeGotThisCovered dot com? No, I did not. Okay, good. <laughs> It was through Twitter and uh, through various different means. And everybody's like, no, it's it's still on. It's still on. And I'm like, okay, if it's still on. And then I haven't heard anything since about it. So I don't know. Uh, it, it might be rumor. It might be just something that people just wanted to spark up. Who knows? I think it might be just rumor at this point. Yeah. yeah. Well, as long as they still give us the What If series, I'm happy. Oh, definitely. Same here, because from what I saw about, you know, with Captain America oh, and Peggy becoming Captain America is going to be amazing. Uh, exactly. And as well as the zombies. Yep. Come on. You saw that. So uh, my, my feeling is I want to see the what if and we're inclined to get that as soon yeah. as possible, hopefully. Yeah. I'm excited so, for what if. We have a special thanks to Kirk Manley for our artwork for our podcast. So check out Kirk Manley at, on his website at www.studiokm.com. Or you could check him out on Twitter at BatmanKM. Instagram, he could be found at BatmanKM. Or you could check out his artwork at BatmanKM.deviantArt.com. If you have something that you would like to hire Kirk for, you can just email him at kirk at studiokm.com. Obviously, Ben does several podcasts. So. <laughs> um, I do several podcasts already with a couple more in development right now. I'm a podcasting fiend. As a matter of fact, Kristen and I, my co-host for the We Have to Go Back Lost Revisited podcast, in which we're actually going to be a little late. We we usually record on Wednesday or Thursday mornings. We had technical difficulties this morning, so we're going to be recording. We usually record on Wednesday, Thursday, and then release on Friday morning. We're not going to be re recording until tomorrow morning, which is Friday, but it's going to be up by like noon. 
uh, tomorrow. So we're just going to be a couple hours behind. But Kristen and I actually, when we talked this morning, actually came up with a new podcast idea that the moment we came up with it, we absolutely loved it. And we are 100% going to do it. I'll give you a little backstory as to how it happened. Kristen found this article online of the top ranked Brad Pitt movies. And we found that a lot of the movies that were on the list should have been much higher. And some of them were at the top shouldn't have been on the list at all. And the the phrase that kept coming from our mouths, if you know Kristen and I, you will completely understand, uh, was, this is bullshit. Um, <laughs> So we actually talked about it. We are actually going to start a new podcast in which we find these lists online and we go over them and talk about whether or not they're real, give our opinions on these lists and stuff like that. The title of the podcast, This is Bullshit. Nice. Um, so that's in very early development right now as we just talked about it yesterday. Uh, yes, but the We Have to Go Back Lost Revisited podcast, which is a, a joint podcast between the Next Level Podcast Network and the Podcastica Network. We talk about the next episode of Lost every week. Uh, obviously, DC Primetime, which I talked about, which is ending, but um, you can still go back and check out back episodes, episodes in which we interview people like John Wesley Shipp, Tom Welling, David Harewood, Teddy Sears, a number of people from the DC shows. Uh, I have the spotlight, which is going to be coming back, which is my celebrity interview podcast, which is going to be coming back, uh, by next month, uh, in February with all new celebrity interviews. And yeah, that's about all I'm on. I have other shows I'm developing too, including a film podcast, which was originally called Wilhelm. And now it's going to be called spoiler dome. Nice. Um, or be, oh, uh, what did I, oh shit. What did I call it? Um, Damn it! I I changed the name. <laughs> oh, I think it's beyond. Oh, beyond Spo- beyond spoiler dome. But yeah, beyond spoiler dome is going to be a film roundtable podcast, uh, in which obviously spoilers are going to be allowed to fly. So, but yeah, that's that's me in a podcasting nutshell. <laughs> well, to submit your feedback for our podcast, you can submit your feedback on Facebook. We have a, a group on Facebook, which is just facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one. The TO is spelled out right there in the middle. And then the number one at gmail.com. You can call us and leave a voicemail at 845-350-2095. We are also now on YouTube. You can find us at panels to pixels podcast on YouTube. So just search it out and give us a thumbs up, share us with your friends. It's great. If you listen to your podcast, however you listen to your podcast, whether you listen to them on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, whatever podcast player of choice, or YouTube, that's the way you listen to your podcasts, please go on there, give us a rating, give us a review, let us know, and we will share it on the podcast. Can I just say real quick, too, that I am um, extremely happy and very pleased and proud to have you guys as part of next Aww. level. You guys have been great. I'm happy that you guys, we, we, we renew contracts every year um, and you guys renewed for another year. I hope you continue to keep with it as this network continues to grow. And yeah, I've just been very happy and pleased to have you guys as part of the network. Thanks. Well, we, we should hit on to it. <laughs> I think we should hit 100. We might hit 100 this year. Good. I think we're at 70. This is 77. So 23 more. There's yeah. more than 23 weeks left. <laughs> those, the are, those are huge milestones, and I will um, – I, I, maybe I'll work some magic to get you guys a guest. Ooh. <laughs> I, I don't know who, but I hear Jared Leto's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Goodness. As long as he does the Joker voice. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, what about you? Where else can you be heard on the interwebs? Well, on the interwebs, you could actually hear me. I'm a co-host on the Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media. We review the Walking Dead each week. This show will always stay on the Next Level Podcast Network, but there will be a link for Talk Through Media as well through our Facebook page, as well as so you can hear us and listen to us. Listen to us on talkthroughmedia.com are on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We currently are working on a lot of things. Brian currently right now is working on PicardCast. So there's a lot going on there. So if you're not subscribed, I suggest you subscribe. I know Ben is 
interested and is into the idea of Picard. So I'm. Oh, I can't wait. Oh yeah, I I I want to be on the the first episode. I'm sure Brian's going to do a roundtable, so that's going to be a whole big venture. <laughs> that guy so, is one of the biggest Star Trek fans I have ever met. Oh, definitely. Um, Anytime I see Brian Malasha's posted, I'm like, ooh, what Star Trek news has come out now? <laughs> and that's not, I'm not, I'm not digging on him. Like, that's, that's great. I'm glad he has a passion for it, especially doing the podcasting about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. With uh, Star Trek Discovery, the Picard cast, everything. So go through talkthroughmedia.com uh, and you can check out everything on Talk Through Media that we have. Cool. So uh, talkthroughmedia.com website check that out so you can hear me of course right here on uh, on this podcast but i also submit voicemail feedback to many other podcasts including the we have to go back lost revisited podcast uh, with ben and Kristen, and i usually send them a manifest minutes as well uh, i've done that this week so we love your feedback too uh, i love i love hearing my own voice apparently <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, we have that in common. And uh, uh, I also submit uh, feedback regularly to Strange Indeed, which is a Podcastica network uh, show, which is now the, right now they are uh, following Netflix second season of You, and they're doing two episodes a week of that show. So you can hear me there also. So amazing stuff that's going on with all of us, obviously. I always recommend Ben Beck listen to the Celebrity Spotlight. I've got some some good guests that I'm uh, I'm working on for um, for the Spotlight when it comes back. Uh, I've I'm in negotiations, nothing solid yet, but there's one I'm very excited for, and I will just leave you with the hint. <clears throat> Let me see if I can do this properly. <laughs> uh? Oh no! Ooh, exciting! Wow! Exciting. Working. Working on that one. I've been working on that one for a couple months now. So we'll see if that one, uh, if that one happens. That's uh, that's one I've wanted for a long time. So it's it's looking promising right now that it might happen. So we'll we shall see. I might oh have to give goodness. you some questions for that one. Hey man, at any time. Like, and I'm actually thinking of starting. I don't have any social media for the spotlight. Like, I don't have a Facebook page for it. I don't have a Twitter and Instagram. I, everything I do with the spotlight, I just do through the Next Level Facebook page. Which, by the way, if anybody wants to listen to any of the podcasts on Next Level, not just mine or yours, there's a lot of great podcasts on Next Level. Go to the Next Level Network dot com. That's the website, and then all the podcasts are there, and links to. Their iTunes, Google, Spotify, everything can be found on the homepage. So that's the easiest way to do it. And facebook.com slash the next level network too. But I think I'm going to have to create some social media presence for the spotlight, especially if I start getting guests like that, because I do yes. want people to have input and be able to ask questions and things like that. So uh, you might see like a spotlight Facebook page pop up sometime in the very near future. Very cool. Very cool. So with that, that's our show tonight. <laughs> So thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And I'm Ben, apologizing for taking up most of your time. Oh, come on. We love <laughs> you. And this was Panels to Pixels. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Sounds like we need to call pest control. What was that?